Mr. President, Ray McGovern is here to brief you. All right, Ray, more bad news, huh? Well, I wish I could say uh, good news, Mr. President, but it's been a hectic day and uh, night. And uh, let's see if I can get myself oriented here. I have lots of notes from which to speak. Uh, most important uh, is that uh, Lebanon has suffered its worst day since 2006, the last time the Israelis attacked Lebanon in, in large measure. Uh, what we have is uh, over a thousand killed already. Uh, people are saying uh, 16, well, five, 500 killed are the latest estimates. This comes from both the New York Times and the Washington Post just in. Uh, 1,600 injured, the deadliest day since 2006. I, I would remind you, Mr. President, that in 2006, uh, Hezbollah won, okay, Israel had to retreat. Now, the other thing here is that uh, Netanyahu, who is in charge, of course, and running all this, uh, he's delayed for the third time his departure for uh, New York and the UN, uh, UN General Assembly meeting here that's, that has just started. Uh, there's question as to when he will arrive. Uh, the latest uh, guess is Wednesday, and he's supposed to speak on Friday, and then he's going to go right home. So you may be spared a tete-a-tete a -tete with him. Uh, but that speaks volumes that Netanyahu would be delaying his departure, not only because of what's going on in Lebanon, but also because of what the International Criminal Court is doing. Uh, there's all likelihood that they could indict him. And then let's say he had engine failure on his jet uh, going to Washington, uh, landed in London. Um, he might be served papers. There is such a thing as uh, international law that would entitle, actually require even Britain or Paris if he landed there uh, under uh, extraordinary circumstances to arrest him and charge him as a war criminal. That, of course, can extend to other people who support Netanyahu. So just to, re just to return to uh, what we had here in the beginning, uh, what do we have in terms of comment on all this? The Secretary General of the UN, Gutierrez, has said, oh my God, this looks like Gaza number two. Wow. He said, this is the worst that he's seen. Uh, it runs the risk of making Lebanon uh, another Gaza. Um, Secretary Austin was talking with his counterpart, Gallant, in Israel today. Uh, it appears that Secretary Austin had no new instructions, and so he said, guess what? Israel has a right to defend itself. And then he said, uh, you know, we'd really like, let's I quote him here, um, he stressed the importance of finding a diplomatic solution, but there wasn't one hint as to what that could be. In other words, it looks like uh, there is no change in our open policy toward, uh, toward Israel and what it's doing. And once again, Mr. President, I would stress that the only thing that could change that is you. And uh, I think uh, your military would be delighted if you uh, stood up and said, look, uh, Mr. Netanyahu, uh, we don't want a regional war in the, in the Middle East. Uh, we need to curb our weapons supply. And by the way, Mr. Netanyahu, that young American woman that was, that was shot by a sniper, uh, you told me or your people told me that was some sort of ricochet. Give me a break. All my people say that was impossible. It's physically impossible. So would you investigate that and get back to me? Because there are people in America that are really, really upset about yet another young American woman being shot by a sniper. So that's the lay of the land right here. Uh, again, uh, in our view, uh, Netanyahu is trying to mousetrap you into overt military support because he cannot win any more than he could win or the Israelis could win in 2006 without full-throated U.S. support. Now, Austin is still giving it to him. 
He needs, in our view, uh, different instructions if Israel is going to stop. Well, why should they stop? They 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 want to have a buffer there so they don't get shot at from Lebanon. There are people uh, missiles landing in Israel, so they've got to have a buffer. And uh, what, what do we know? Are, are we involved? I can't get a straight answer from anybody around here. Everybody says no. But is it possible that Netanyahu moved and we didn't know about it? What kind of intelligence do you guys got going? That he moved physically? Well, they just say, oh, it's extending the war to Hezbollah, the last thing we needed here. And get the rest of the Arab world all agitated and everything. Mm-hmm. What, what's well, going on? I mean, we we we, 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 we got to be knowing what's going on. We must have given a, some kind of green light that no one told me about. Well, Mr. President, I think uh, Netanyahu, very clever person, uh, he looks at your comment, for example, about the ricochet, and he says, whoa, when we tell Biden, he'll repeat to the press, which, of course, you did. You later said that it was not really a good idea. It was You condemned it. But uh, that's a measure of how Netanyahu thinks he can still manipulate U.S. presidents. And I think the major factor here is there's six weeks left before the election, I think he believes that he has you by the short hairs, if you'll forgive the expression, and that you can't possibly do anything but what Austin just said, full-throated the support for Israel's right to defend itself. So that's why he's moving out. And as I say, uh, the Israeli army is smart enough to realize that they will not be able to prevail in any of this you know, beyond the six weeks here without support from the United States. And if you cra- if you cast some doubt on that, if you, the president of the United States said, you know, we're not going to support an open war, that would change the calculus. Netanyahu would not be able to persuade his IDF, his Israeli defense forces, to go forward. They'd have to stop before they obliterate Lebanon or make it into another Gaza. Yeah, well, we're not going to do that because... Uh... Uh, there's an election. There is an election. Is reality. The reality is Trump is promising he'll turn Gaza into a parking lot or something with Israel, make a resort area. I don't know what the hell he's talking about, but I don't even care. I don't know. Uh, it, it's it's a terrible end game. And then, well, but I think Israel controls the air. They can knock out uh, Hezbollah, and maybe uh, it, it will be stable that way. You know. Well, Mr. President, the, the buzzword in Washington is uh, we're letting Israeli the Israelis escalate to de-escalate. Um, what the hell does so, that mean, Ray? What is well, that? <laughs> no, well, well, you I, asked, I, are, you, are you buying that? So what is that? Escalate? No, I'm glad you asked that question. It means nothing. It means there's no off-ramp plan. In other words, you escalate to de-escalate. Give me a break. Escalate brings more no, escalation. I mean, they, they take over that whole what one third of Lebanon. Israel will control it again, and uh, and then there won't be any attacks on on the Israelis. That's the main thing. Netanyahu has got to have that, and yeah. then he'll declare victory again. And uh, the main thing is we haven't found any partners anywhere that care about peace. And uh, that you can negotiate with, I don't know. Uh, that's what I keep hearing. And I'm, frankly, I don't have much leverage here. I don't want to do anything to uh, damage Kamala because you get that maniac Trump in there. And what am I supposed to do? I don't want to undermine her. But, uh, but this is so- this is not going well for anybody. I don't know what the hell. I mean. When the, the Israeli people, they're never going to reject Netanyahu, right? He's a winner. He's got to, there, there's a different population. This is not, you know, what, what Clinton faced when he was negotiating all that stuff about peace and people like Rabin. I don't know these Israelis. They're, they're different now, right? They're, they're, I mean, what the hell happened there? And they, well, maybe Mr. they were, what's her name, Edelman or whatever, the gambler's wife? Gives him, you know, gives uh, Trump all this money in the Edelson or whatever. Yeah. whatever. And then, yeah. And they, uh, they, uh, they, they, 
most Jews, they're not right wing, but I mean, the, a lot of them with money and everything, they seem to be pumping money into Trump, right? Some of the casino types, I don't know who the hell they yeah, are. And this, this, yeah, and this worries your party very much. And I would say that uh, given what you've just said, uh, your views pretty much dovetail with Netanyahu's, uh, who thinks that you can't do anything and that Kamala can't do anything before the election. And that's precisely why he feels free to up the up the hey, escalation. She's, she's, uh, Ray, I don't know why we even bother talking to politics because you never get it through your thick skull what it is. You never had to run for office. You don't know what it's like. But she's ahead of the polls now, okay? That itself is a miracle, okay? And now they're, bl- they're saying that I should have got out earlier. I sure the hell am not going to sabotage or hurt her in any way now. You can, you know, they'll never forgive me for that. And if she wins, then there's, you know, she can do some damage control here and try to knock some sense into Netanyahu. You can't do it before the election or Trump's going to win. We land on Netanyahu and then uh, Trump's going to lose, you know. That's what everybody tells and win. He'll win. And that's what everybody tells me here. So let's just drop it. We waste too much time. I'm not I'm not going to undermine. Uh, I can't just frontally challenge Netanyahu. We tried. Yeah. They're not interested. And, and you know, I don't notice any big uh, sentiment among the Israeli people. Yeah, they want to get the captives out and everything, and they demonstrate. But they're not demonstrating for ending this war stuff, you know, in Gaza or anywhere else, you know. So it's a different That's- Israel. It's a different Israel. And uh, I I dealt with Israel all my life. They used to be very reasonable people you could talk to. They didn't always listen, but you could talk to them. But now, you're right. I don't like your profanity about the short hairs, but, yeah, they got us. They got us. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Mr. President, when you talk about the Israelis... Give me some good good news. I gather it's going better in Ukraine. (laughs) Oh, Mr. President, I wish I could give you some good news. Um, it's not all well, good wait, news. Wait, 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 before you even start, why is it so hard? Now, I'm not asking you to lie to me, but I mean, you read the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, everything, and, uh, and, and you know, Ukraine's kicking ass there, you know, and they're, they're still in Russia. They got some something to bargain with. And, you know, why are you always so pessimistic? I know you know about the country. You speak the language there, you know, but, uh, you know, maybe you got it wrong. Maybe it is optimistic now. It could be, Mr. President. Uh, as you know, we strive for objectivity to tell you like it is. Uh, the, the reason we sound very different is because uh, people like uh, Secretary Austin and, and uh, CIA director and now uh, cabinet uh, member uh, Bill Burns uh, sing a song that's very different that we disagree with. And this is not the first time the CIA analysts disagree what is propounded by their director, namely uh, Bill, well, Bill Burns or Bill Casey or whatever, who were right on Karpachov. Casey was wrong. It all turned out okay, except for what's happening now. Now, what's happening now is really interesting because you are going to be treated to a visit by Volodymyr Zelensky in the next couple of days. And we know what he's going to say because he's been conferring with the most, uh, well, the most perspicacious and wise people as his counselors. Uh, politically, uh, uh, Johnson, Boris Johnson, and militarily. Hey, spare, me the, that... sar- spare me the sarcasm here, okay, Ray? Okay. Just give it to me straight. Or... All right, just straight. Uh, yeah. David Petraeus is his military advisor, okay? That's straight. Uh, you can detect some uh, some wonder in that. Let me just read you what Petraeus has been saying. He says uh, he met with uh, with, Zel- with uh, Boris Johnson and others planning the military side of this uh, in Yalta just a couple weeks ago. And Petraeus, he said, look... Did Petraeus, our ex-CIA head and the general... No, I don't have to trash him, Mr. President. His record speaks for himself. But no, no, but what I mean, what, what's, uh, we got the right Petraeus here? Yeah, it's the same guy. You know, yeah, he's, a, yeah. he's sort of like he's got several lives. And what he said is, look, we need to mobilize young people in Ukraine. I mean, the average age yeah, of the no, wait, soul- wait, 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 Maybe I missed something here. Petraeus, is, he's working for Ukraine now, not us? 
Well, he's a very sage, very sagacious advisor, of course, given his record. And so he's in the in the Ukraine, in Yalta, actually, at this conference with Boris Johnson and other very high level Ukrainian officials. OK, and he's but saying, Boris, look, Boris Johnson, he doesn't speak for anybody anymore. Right. He's out. What is what is he doing? What's well, going on? Actually, he's drafted the program that Zelensky is about to broach to you. Uh, we'll get so to no, that. Wait, wait. These are the former leader of England. <laughs> That's and the right. uh, former head of our CIA and, uh, and everything. And he's, and they're working for Zelensky? They're giving him sagacious advice. Now, they yeah. all met together a couple of weeks ago. And this but is no, no official connection with the British uh, or us? Or? Well, the British are way ahead in, in following the kind of path that Boris Johnson is suggesting. Oh. I just want to finish up with Petraeus suggesting that we have to draft people between 18 and 24 because the average age of the Ukrainian soldier is 40, 4, 0. Well, that in itself is quite a factoid, isn't it? But what Petraeus is saying is, look, we could still win this thing. Just draft the 18-year-olds and we'll get them all in shape. And you know what, Mr. President, that's going to be a year too late to change the tide here. And the tide is is going very badly. So let me let me just tell you what Boris Johnson has composed for uh, Zelensky's approach to you. Now Zelensky himself on Friday, and I want to read this because it's uh, kind of so strange. I don't want to get it wrong, or I don't want you to think I'm uh, hyperventilating or exaggerating. Here we go. Zelensky announced that he had prepared a victory plan, which he's going to deliver to you this week. Um, he wants quick decisions between October and December of this year. That would be you. Now, what about Kursk? What about the invasion of, of Russian territory? Well, you know, the Ukrainians have lost about 15,000 casualties, over half of the troops that went in there. They're losing the rest. And Zelensky is in real trouble internally because Zeluzhny and other high officials who know something about battles said, what are we going to do on the second day, Zelensky? What are we going to do after you uh, captured part of this desolate area in Kursk? That's the question. He's under some pressure to ask that. Now, what is he going to do? He's going to offer you a plan. And here's the plan. It has three elements. It's Boris Johnson drafting this, and it's said to be Zelensky's plan, so you could be prepared for it. Number one. Produce a package of loans for Kiev on the scale of Lend-Lease, you know, back in World War II, half a trillion dollars, or, Boris Johnson suggests, maybe a full trillion dollars. Number two, admit Ukraine forthwith, forthwith, into NATO, so that the alliance could protect most of Ukraine while simultaneously supporting the Ukrainian right to recapture the rest of Ukraine. Number three, allowing the Ukrainians the right to use the weapons that they already have. Now, of course, that's the bone of contention. That was the decision you faced up to on Friday the 13th, uh, which is what it was, in saying that, well, you would not approve the use of Storm Shadow missiles uh, when you met with uh, Prime Minister Stormer in the White House that afternoon. So the British are still trying. Zelensky is still trying. There are a couple of people, the Poles and the, the, the people in the Baltic states, they're still trying. And you're going to be under a considerable pressure when the press comes in and says, okay, well, what did you and Zelensky say? You're going to have to be prepared to say, well, I changed my mind. I approved the, the use of these uh, storm shadow missions, missiles, or you're going to have to say no. He's got enough missiles. And you, well, Austin, you're Secretary of Defense. And what the De Department of Defense spokesman said was, look, the Russians have already moved their essential facilities well out of range of storm shadow or attack of missiles. You have a lot of missiles you can use by yourself. There's no magic bullet that's going to change anything in this war. And use, the, use what you already have and work toward negotiations. That's what your Defense Department is saying. It makes a lot of sense to us. 
Otherwise, Zelensky is really going to try something bizarre in the next six weeks before the election. Uh, that's our calculus. So what about this uh, nuclear threat? I keep hearing about that. Uh, well, I'm glad you asked that, Mr. President, yeah, because... But, uh, but, but, but Russia's not. They have to... They're not going to do that, right? They're bad, they're bad. We've sent enough signals. They know it's the end of everything, right? I mean, there's no... Uh, well, if you ask me of, on the 12th of September, I would say don't rule it out. Why? Because of what President Putin said on the 12th. Later, we learned that uh, the Pentagon stood up and said, you know, this is... Uh, this is kind of not going to help if we approve the use of longer range missiles hitting well inside Mother Russia. And you, in our view, very wisely turned that down. Now they're still trying, okay? But now you ask me what the chances they will use nuclear weapons? Not much at all. They don't have to. Putin's in the, in the, in the captain's chair, for God's sake. He's winning in Ukraine. There's no need at all for him to use nuclear weapons. He has all manner of hypersonic and other sophisticated weaponry that we don't have. He'll use those first and only if he has to, because he's willing to sit down and talk. The only problem is, as I've said to you before, uh, he has no one to talk to. Blinken doesn't talk. Luckily, as we understand it, Defense Secretary Austin is speaking with his opposite number, Bill Usof. And I suspect, we don't know for sure, but we suspect that that was one reason why the Pentagon said, Mr. President, this is not a good idea. And you faced down Blinken and said, no, we're not going to do this. Uh, Blinken having advertised for a whole week before that you were about to approve, or you had already approved the use of these longer range missiles to hit well into the heartland of Russia. So we're just going to putz around until the election and then uh, hopefully Kamala's won and hopefully we can, what? Uh, but I said we're in this for 10 years anyway. So uh, just the reverse of Israel. We, I think on, on, on Israel, that Gaza thing, I think uh, Trump, he might grandstand. I mean, he moved the embassy to Jerusalem. He, he might grandstand and say, Let's go all the way and finish this. After all, he said Netanyahu should move faster or some. So maybe he'll give a blank check and just go for it and and finish. You know, you call it whatever you want. Uh, genocide, I think, is extreme, but you know, uh, just totally destroyed the capacity of the Palestinians to make any trouble at all, and have to go along whatever we tell them or Israel tells them, and then. Uh, and yeah, yeah, he would, he would, he would do that. He'd go pretty far, I think. With the, or he did say something back before the last election about having to even negotiate there. But I think on the Ukraine, he would probably. He says he could cut a deal. What kind of deal would he cut with with Putin? Uh, well, Zelensky is trying to, you know, in some ways, he's like Netanyahu. He's trying to mousetrap you into doing something extraordinary, lest before the election or before you leave office, uh, people will ask, who lost Ukraine? Now, he's joined by the British, by the French, by the Italians, and they're all saying, you know, we have to be stronger. Why? Because when Ukraine goes down, they want to be able to say, we tried our best. We asked the Americans to approve these weapons, and they wouldn't approve it. So... You're on the hook, Mr. President. He's trying to mousetrap you, and we're just trying to get you prepared, as we usually do, for meeting foreign dignitaries, in this case, Zelensky. Now, you should know that his first stop was in Syracuse. <laughs> uh, to uh, Actually, not Syracuse, but at that 155-millimeter uh, uh, factory there up in upstate New York, I believe. Uh, just to give uh, encouragement to the people that are doing these shells, you should know that Zelensky, in talking with Farid Zakaria, said that the Russians outnumber us in 155 military equivalent shells 12 to 1, and that 80% of our electrical system has been knocked out. 
Now, we think that Zelensky was exaggerating, but just a little bit to show Farid Zakaria how much more aid he needed. But if it even it's just six to one, my God, this factory up there in New York is not going to be able to provide one five five millimeter shells in time for the the forces in Ukraine to fold. And we see that happening for the next month or two. You see what happening? We see the Ukrainians just folding, running away, surrendering, being overwhelmed on that major line from but which they still the, have that town, don't they? That that one is supposed to be the, the hub. Yeah. yeah, but ask me next week. Ask me next week. Yeah. Uh, it's heavily fortified. The Russians already have it surrounded. The real deal there is to cut off the supply lines, and they've done that. So it's just a matter of time, Mr. President. And that's another incentive, it seems to me, uh, for the Russians to be taken up on their initiative, saying, look, we're willing to talk. Okay, we're willing to talk. I believe that if uh, you uh, took the initiative, got in touch with uh, with Putin and said, all right, uh, let's talk one way or another, that you might have a chance to affect the outcome. Failing that, well, I believe that Secretary Austin and Belarusov can prevent the worst from happening. But it's going to be pretty bad up to you know, the Ray, election. I, Ray, I know I've been talking to you for years. We've got to end this here. I've got to, no, no, don't tell anybody in the media. i got to take a nap a little bit. I'm tired. I'm sure you get that way yourself. But let me just say, what don't you understand that we live in a democracy with elections and people get to vote and everything? And I'm, the, the whole campaign around... Uh, Kamala is going to be to show that she's tough. She's a prosecutor. Uh, she takes no prisoners. She could defend America. And she's actually been tougher in denouncing Putin, obviously, than Trump. And she's going to she's going to go after him. She's going to say he's he's the Putin agent, right? Trump's a Putin agent. And God knows what Putin's got on him and everything else, right? Now, how the hell I'm not going to undermine her by trying to make a deal with Putin that Zelensky might not like, or he won't like any deal. He's got nothing but the war going right now. What's he going to show for it? So I'm not going to do that. You know I'm not going to do that. Why do you keep bringing this up? You try well, I'm to, not... I, I mean, you, you know, there's a reality here. I only talk to you because you've been in the CIA for 27 bloody years. You think you had learned something about the limits <laughs> Of, of the agency that, you know, you got to, you know, you've overthrown governments. You've not you personally. I know you always make a big deal about it. You're on the analyst side. You're not on the spook side, but your agencies have overthrown a lot of governments in the world. You know what you got to do to overthrow them and also to keep them in power. You've kept a few in power, too. Nobody ever hangs that on you. But, you know, some of them went on to do some pretty bad things. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, don't waste my time with this. I'm not going to destroy Kamala Harris. You know, I believe in her. I believe in the campaign. I believe it's good versus evil. And, you know, we're just, and you sh should believe that too, you know, fool. And uh, what are we going to do? We're trapped here. We're trapped on both Israel and we're trapped there on Ukraine. It's just that simple. And let's just muddle through, muddle through. I know you don't like to hear that. You always think you can game everything, figure everything out. But this is an illogical world. Otherwise, I'd still be looking for my second term. But, you know, in the media, my, if I do anything at all to undermine Kamala, I, I just inherit, I, I become the guy who might have put Trump in power again. I can't live with that. That's well, just, Mr. President. It's just yeah, going too far. And why are you, you know, Ray, I talk to you because, you know, you're, you're a smart guy and you've been around. But what, what, what are you trying to do? I mean, I... I'm doing the best I can. Don't you understand that? Well, what I understand, Mr. President, is that you have a unique opportunity now that may not occur to you. And that what, is you are... to destroy Kamala Harris's chance. No, to... you are a lame that's what, that's what you're putting. Look, if I go now <laughs> and say you got six weeks to election, but I'm going to negotiate or start something with Putin, that takes Trump off the hook because we're saying he's a Putin agent. And then uh, and then what is he? What, what, how are we going to attack him? Well, I'm 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 talking to him. It's like Nixon going to China. You know, so once Nixon went to China, you couldn't 
attack Mao or you couldn't attack the Chinese communists. Oh, you're doing business with them. So, and that takes away the whole issue for Kamala, where she's got a whole campaign. They've already spent the money. They designed it. You know, this whole reality. And they're going to label Trump the agent of Putin. And she's the tough law and order. She's going to win for America. She's going to make America great because she's a prosecutor. I, I see her ass. They all talk about how she's been a prosecutor. She gets the bad guys. She protects the border better than he does. They're not giving up that message, no matter what I tell them. And if I go something against that, I'll be blamed. The whole media have me for lunch, you know, uh, that I was jealous of her or something like that, or I felt betrayed or wanted to prove that I could have done better. I can't go that route. I just can't go there. You know, that's it. And you just don't understand because you never held any. You weren't even a elected dog catcher or something. I mean, you know. No, right? no I was, Mr. Yeah. President. I, I was president of the Madison Manor Citizens Association in Arlington, oh. Virginia, a big deal in those days. Oh, and Mr. President, let, let me let me not make light of this. Um, uh, what I want to say here is that uh, as things thicken here, the Europeans yeah. are finding it very convenient to blame you for what's going to happen in the next few weeks. And if it doesn't happen before the election, it's going to happen before the end of your term on the 20th of January. Now, the unique opportunity that I see you have is to help Kamala by recognizing your lame duck status, going towards some sort of peaceful overture and taking the rug out from Kamala's opponent, who is is trying to appear to be the peace candidate on Ukraine. A, a simple sample of my neighbors. Who are you going to vote for? Trump. Why? Because he's going to stop the war in Ukraine. My God, what, what Kamala would be would be helped if you stuck your neck out and said, yeah, I'm going to take a lot of flack about this, but I'm going to make sure that the Democrats seem equally interested in peace. And so I'm going to reach out and we'll get some talks going before the election. That's how I look at it. And, you know, yeah. I'm let me, tell you Let me tell you something. We got polling data. We got a lot of that stuff. And you know what? Margaret Thatcher was a hawk, and she won because she was a hawk. But no one could call her a hawk because she was a woman, right? And she could, you know, craft it, messaging, you know, messaging. Just the whole thing, you know. Uh, Kamala Trump is trying to say he's got the you know, uh, what do you, you call him? He's got the privates or whatever to, to be tough and everything. But she comes along and says, her whole campaign, she's a prosecutor. She's tough. She protects the border. Uh, she supports Ukraine a thousand percent, you know? She's very clear on that. He's a Putin agent. She ain't going to drop that, okay? Let just uh, Don't waste my time with this anymore. She's not going to drop that. And if I do anything to start some peace process here with this murderous bastard who, you know, uh, made my life miserable, that Putin guy, uh, you know, uh, I'd be the traitor, I'd be the spoiler. And, you know, we have something of a, I wouldn't say friendship, I mean, uh, you know, but we have something of a connection here. I've, I've been talking to you a couple of different administrations, you know, and just cut me a little slack here. If I see an opportunity, I see an opportunity that's not suicide, I do it on either one of these fronts. But it's got to be pretty damn clear because I'm not going down as the spoiler, you know, for, for the first woman of color, woman candidate that's got a chance. I'm not doing that talk. It's not just legacy. It's just I feel it's the right thing. Let her have her shot here. And let the world, I don't know what, take care of itself. Well, Mr. President, the last thing I'll say is simply that uh, she's going to be faced with the kind of situation that Scott Ritter explains in that famous piece where he said, unless you made the right decision, we're pretty close to a nuclear exchange. She's going to be faced with that same decision by and by when you're gone or even before you leave office. Uh, you're going to have to deal with that because the Russians are not going to stop and the Europeans and others are going to accuse you of being sort of uh, milk toast 
if you don't authorize all these kinds of things that what amount the hell to happened to those Europeans? They used to be the Ohne Uns. You remember the Germans? Ohne they Uns, be, yeah. Yeah, Ohne Uns. And they used to be uh, for peace. You know, we were the warmongers. They're the peaceniks. Now what? They all want the big one to come? They want, I mean, what? They, they're, they're, uh, uh, I'm like, we got to end this, but it, it's just, it's a scary. And when I put on my other hat and really think about the responsibilities of being president, you kidding? You think I don't wake up at three in the morning thinking the phone's ringing or some the alarm is going off or the code? I can't even tell you what our systems are. You you're not even supposed to know. But you think I don't wake up with a, suddenly awake and think I've been alerted? And what the hell am I going to do? You can't sit in this job and not be worried. I don't need any Scott Ritter or anybody to tell me to be worried about that but i'm telling you you know it's uh the presidency is not a position of power i'll tell you that and you think it is everybody thinks it is still sitting here but tell richard nixon that as they kicked his ass and got him out of there you know uh you take a couple of wrong steps and you're finished i don't care who you are so you live in dread of that dread of that that you're going to be humiliated you know, I don't know how the hell Clinton survived, you know, what he did in the White House. Intern, all that stuff. God damn, how somebody could risk everything. But that's a whole nother matter. I'll see you next time, Ray, you know. But uh, being president ain't all it's cracked up to be. And you should know that by now. You briefed about five or six of them, you know. And all of them had their nightmares. And none of them did so well. Not the fault of your briefing, of course. But uh, it's... it's uh, it sucks. You know why it sucks, Ray? I'll tell you, really. Because we have claimed to be the all-knowing, all-virtuous leaders of civilization. And that, you know, come on, try to fill that role, you know, when you're supposed to also be preserving what we're not allowed to call an empire, but it's the biggest empire ever. And and I got to preserve it because it's, it's not an empire of slavery. It's an empire of freedom. Now, I don't know, sometimes I think we're nuts to be pushing that line, but there it is, you know, and, uh, you know, it's like, come on, we used to have machine politics in America, and you had to pretend it was wonderful, right, even though it was mostly Democrats, you know, run them big city things, I know that, I dealt with a lot of shady characters in my life, so, it's, it, you know, I mean, as, you know, I'm not so unhappy to be leaving, let me tell you, because this looks like a pretty screwed up world hopefully you'll retire someday and maybe we'll play a game of checkers somewhere in some old people's home take care ray nice talking to you again thank you mr president